Welcome to Healthcare Bias, Costs, and Financial Planning. This is a very important section, not that any one section is less or more important, but we're going to talk about ethical care and complicated medical decisions as the care needs of elder adults progress. We as the caregiver, we as the power of attorney or the guardian, begin to become involved in helping parents make medical decisions, talking about them within the family, or sometimes we make that medical decision. As a caregiver, sometimes it may be difficult to know what to do. You may be pressed to make decisions in a very short period of time. This is why it is so important to know what your elderly parents want. We'll talk about this throughout this program, and I'll share a couple of stories, as I always do. Let's proceed on to housekeeping, as I always do at the beginning of every show. So you know how this goes. I substitute elderly parent or elderly parents throughout the program. You substitute that term with whoever you're taking care of, the outline for the module, and the course materials. If you haven't printed out the slide handouts, do it, take notes, write down questions. The ellipses in the slides, I purposely put them in there so that you can follow along with me. Let's talk about the objectives of ethical care and complicated medical decisions. At the end of this section, you should be able to support a process of reasoning for making complicated medical decisions that may conflict with recommendations of healthcare providers. We talked about bias in the last segment. You do not always have to agree with what a doctor is telling you to do, asking you to do, or recommending if you or your elderly parent know different or if you want something different. At the end of this segment, you should also be able to determine how the level of participation of family caregivers impacts the success of medical care and the ability of your parent to stay at home. Sometimes, no matter how much family caregivers do or how much family wants to keep an elderly parent at home, it isn't possible. Sometimes the only option is to move to a care community. So we have to be able to accept what we can do and what we can't do to keep elderly parents at home and to provide care. Statistics don't lie. Statistics indicate the known risks that are more specific to care for older adults with dementia. We've talked about statistics throughout the program. The Alzheimer's Association confirms that 32% of people over age 85 are diagnosed with Alzheimer's, but many of these individuals, as we've talked, also have vascular dementia, which relates to heart disease and circulatory issues. It is known that a diagnosis of dementia complicates medical treatment. It makes medical treatment more complicated, more difficult. Studies by Toussaint and Konya confirm that dementia does not complicate recovery and functional gain post hip fractures. We're gonna talk again about hip fractures because it's an easy subject to relate to. In those who were mobile before the fracture, it's important, does not complicate recovery for people who are mobile before the fracture. A hip fracture is not going to make your parent better. It will make them worse if they were not mobile. So what also complicates recovery is the refusal of a physician to write orders for physical therapy, the refusal or inability of physical therapists to work with your elderly parents who may not have been as mobile. Some physicians and physical therapists, they're uneducated about working with patients diagnosed with dementia. It is a skill, it's a learned skill. Taking care of your parents with dementia, you learn every single day. I have learned every single day over the past 20 years. I continue to learn. Another study confirmed that walking ability is a predictor of survival in people with memory loss. This is important for you as a caregiver. The less your parent walks or can walk, which means they have worse balance, their gait is not good, the ability to take one step and put it in front of another, the higher a likelihood of a fall, a hip fracture, the greater difficulty of recovery if your parents were not active. Make walking a daily activity for yourself, elderly parent, for your children, for everybody that you know. 
So I want to talk about Beth's story. So Beth was a client of mine and she had dementia. She lived at home for a period of time and then at a point she couldn't be left alone 24 hours a day like most elderly parents. She moved into an assisted living community, lived there successfully for a period of time, but one day she was found on the floor next to her bed. She was sent to the hospital. The hospital, believe it or not, sent her back saying there was nothing wrong with her. Next day, same thing happened. This time the hospital said, oh, she has a hip fracture. Honestly, her hip was probably fractured the day before. They didn't care to be attentive enough. But what happened with Beth was she went to the hospital and the physician, not well versed with dementia, refused to do a full hip replacement. They put a pin in for an elderly person with dementia. Not having a full hip replacement can be extremely detrimental to their health. In Beth's case, it was. A pin meant that she would be non-weight bearing for a period of time. And the physician really didn't say whether it would be a week or two weeks. It ended up being two months. Can you imagine what happens after two months with an elderly person who stops walking? They can't remember to walk. This physician not being able to predict how long she would be weight bearing, not taking into consideration the degree of her dementia, probably not having much experience at all in working with people with dementia, basically gave her a death sentence by saying, let's put a pin in and see what happens. I'll share more of Beth's story later in this series so that you can hear about the progression. But these are important questions to ask when health events happen and it's important to be proactive because the health of your elderly parent can change in an instant. These are all what I call hard lessons to learn. Family members die from medical mistakes, from poor medical recommendations. Caregivers feel guilty that they didn't know or do more. This was the situation in my own family and why I'm such a strong advocate for care for the elderly and caregivers becoming educated and proactive. If I knew over 20 years ago what I know today, my mother's life might have been different. I know it's easy to say, ah, oh, you would have never known that, but I can at least say that the care in the nine years, the last nine years of her life would have been totally different because I would have been more involved. I would have known questions to ask. We all, all of us children could have been proactive and we could have done more. We relied in the doctors to educate us and the healthcare system to educate us. And that just didn't happen. And it still does not happen today. General healthcare practitioners don't specialize in dementia or even many chronic diseases of the elderly. Geriatricians are the specialists who are more aware of long-term progression of the disease and how to treat it. So it is so important to talk to specialists, ask for referrals to specialists. Again, your healthcare plan, it may cost the plan a little more money. Your doctor may not want to do that. You have to be the one to ask. In the case of my client, Beth, if the surgeons were more educated, interested in caring, a different decision might've been made for that hip fracture surgery. Uneducated family caregivers trust the medical system. Most are unaware of the need to advocate for your elderly parents with or without dementia. I always say trust the medical system, but verify the information, ask questions to get the real story, take the information and then keep asking questions. Don't always necessarily believe that the information that you get is reliable. Try to verify it, try to get more information. Let's talk about the path of what happens as a result of a hip fracture for your elderly parent with dementia. After care and treatment is a low priority like we talked about because of the belief that your parent may not recover or may not participate. You're the one, you are the hope to prove doctors wrong, to help your parent to regain their physical abilities. Regaining physical abilities though that may not have been there before health incidents can take a great amount of time. So it may take a lot of your time and effort 
to get your parent physically and actively engaged again? You can do it, but again, it's a choice. The question, as we asked in the last section, what are you willing to do? What is your elderly parent willing to do? Walking is a use it or lose it proposition, as is physical activity, muscle strength, everything that relates to our body. Older adults diagnosed with dementia who don't walk on a regular basis eventually lose the strength and the ability to walk. As a caregiver, compare and track physical abilities of your elderly parent day to day, week to week, month to month. Do the same thing for yourself. Walking is a use it or lose it proposition. As muscle strength decreases, balance and the ability to put one foot in front of another and walk to move yourself forward, elderly parents become wobbly, they become uneven, they fall. At the same time that walking speed starts to decline, you'll notice a combination of muscle loss, maybe poor balance, poor gait, it increases the likelihood of a fall. I cannot stress that enough. Let's talk about surgery questions. And this, we're, again, we're gonna talk about hip fractures, but it could be any type of surgery. This line of questioning works for anything. So the type of surgical treatment for a hip fracture varies by the type of the fracture. If it's a hip fracture, you wanna ask what type. Is it a pin? Is it a full hip fracture? Ask questions then about recovery. So what do we expect after the surgery? Will my mom and dad be up and walking? Will they be non-weight bearing? How long do you think it will take for them to recover? The physician may hedge, but have them give you examples of other people, other patients in similar types of situations. Then the other question is, what if a full recovery doesn't happen? What do daily activities look like then? What type of help might my parent need then? The important thing is you want to know so that you can plan for the positives, full recovery, wonderful, but also to be prepared for the negatives. Your elderly person or parent has lost significant mobility. They need more hands-on care. You might have to bring care into the house. Ask these hard questions. Ask the answers that you are afraid to hear because that news might not be good. You really do want to know so that you can be prepared because being prepared avoids unexpected situations, family disagreements, chaos, having to make decisions at the last minute. So more hip surgery questions. How quickly after surgery will weight bearing be allowed? The answer in this case that you want to hear is within 24 hours. If the answer is non-weight bearing, again, it's a warning signal. Explain concerns that your elderly parent will forget how to walk. The physician may not even take that into consideration. The surgeon may not even know. Raise questions also about the anesthesia. The anesthesiologist will go through all of these risks with you, and it seems just like a laundry list of all these things that can happen because they're legally responsible to tell you all of this. One of the most common consequences is risks of vomiting and nausea. Tell the anesthesiologist that you want anesthesia that doesn't result in nausea and vomiting. There is low-grade anesthesia and then there is what I call the good stuff. It's just like the difference between regular premium and high-grade gasoline that you put into your car. I know this because I was a victim of low-grade anesthesia early in my life. When my mom was having all of her heart issues, I started running and I had to have right arthroscopic knee surgery. I was given low grade anesthesia and when I woke up, I was so nauseated and vomiting that I had to sit in the recovery room for six to seven hours. I later asked about this and the anesthesiologist said, oh, you were probably given low grade surgery because you didn't express any concerns. Next time, make sure they know. Make sure that they give you the higher grade anesthesia so that you don't vomit and be nauseated. The other anesthesia concern with individuals with dementia is that sometimes it makes them more confused when they come out. So they have confusion related to dementia until the anesthesia wears off. There's always the risk though that that level of confusion will be permanent. 
I consistently talk about how delaying physical activity equals poor recovery and lower survival rates, and I'm going to share research about this. According to research by Menzies, a delay in getting the patient out of bed leads to poor functional recovery and worse six-month survival rates. This idea can be applied to surgery and the idea of being hospitalized for any condition. The longer a person lays in bed, doesn't matter who it is, us, your elderly parent, the longer we're not active, the longer it takes to recover our strength. Once an individual with dementia stops walking, the ability to walk again is more unlikely without significant effort. And even then it may not be possible. Daily movement that is repetitive, like walking, it's an automatic skill. When an automatic activity like walking is taken away from any of us for a length of time, the memory of how to do that skill gets worse and it's more difficult to be able to do it again. Clients of mine who were dedicated walkers, who fractured hips, they had surgery, they were up walking the next day after surgery. They quickly returned home. They even forgot they had surgery and they continued to walk as they did before. These individuals, they defied the odds. They lived for many years after the surgery, even with a diagnosis of dementia. Let's just talk about some general statistics about the after effects of people who fracture hips. 13% of people living in the community die within one year. 20% living in assisted living die within one year. 30% of people with dementia or those who live in nursing homes die within one year. Don't let yourself, don't let an elderly parent who is inactive or physically weak become one of these statistics. It's unnecessary, it shouldn't happen. Because daily activity, it should be mandatory. My experience, again, confirmed by research, indicates the importance of daily walking, exercise for everybody, not only elderly parents, but especially us. Question. Can you now identify the relationship between physical activity and physical ability? Do you see changes in this difference for yourself? If yes, it's never too early to embrace daily physical activity of any kind for adults who are admitted to skilled nursing for rehab. Serious discussions should happen upon admission, upon the first care conference, about how your parent is going to rehab and what their commitment is. How many days of physical therapy? How many hours of physical therapy? The challenge that you're gonna run into is something called patient's rights. And this is complicated when people have dementia. Patient's rights means that all individuals are asked to consent to agree to activities. People with dementia who are asked if they want to participate in physical therapy, what do you think they say? No. Healthcare providers should know never to ask an elderly person a yes or no question because the response is usually no. They may not understand what you're asking them to do. For example, Mrs. Smith, are you ready to come to rehab? Mrs. Smith says no. The physical therapist checks off refused. Mrs. Smith refused on that daily sheet. She moves on to the next patient. Her job is easier. After seven days, Mrs. Smith has made no progress. She continues to lay in bed. Nursing home says, well, you know what? She is not going to get any better. Send her back home, send her back to her care community. And now Mrs. Smith is permanently wheelchair bound. That has a whole list of new health risks. For you, the lack of being proactive and recognizing the importance of special treatment, of special attention to physical therapy, it's so important. I always ask people, if this were your mother, would you allow her to say no to physical therapy? What would you do differently in this situation? Little thought is given by healthcare staff in communities about more appropriate ways to approach dementia patients to gain their participation. Training is sorely lacking. And if you as a family member don't step in to participate in therapy sessions, they may not even occur. Let's look at why dementia patients refuse. It's important for us to increase the sensitivity level to refusals and to improve one-to-one -one interactions because older people deserve respect. People with memory loss deserve and they need special treatment. 
They can't successfully be treated if we treat them like people who do not have memory loss. As I mentioned, questions with yes or no answers, don't even ask them. Eliminate them from your vocabulary. Dementia patients also can refuse to participate in physical therapy after a hip fracture because they feel pain and they might be unable to communicate that pain to the physical therapist. Feelings of pain, it can result in them showing anger, being agitated, being combative. There's a term called as needed in medical speak, and you'll hear the term PRN, which means as needed medications. For elderly parents and people with dementia, pain medications can't be provided PRN because they're not going to ask. A person with dementia doesn't know how to ask for pain medications. The better option is to have the prescription written to, given, to be given 30 minutes before physical therapy sessions and possibly even within a certain time after to avoid pain. You have to make that request. It's a special consideration. Again, it's special treatment, it's necessary. Family and special support for physical therapy. I'll continue to use a hip fracture just because it's easy for this discussion. Think about time of day. Time of day is important in timing activities or physical therapy time for older adults with memory loss. How many of you, you're better in the morning, you're better in the evening, you're a night owl, you get up at 3 a.m. For elderly parents, Mornings might be better, afternoons might be terrible, vice versa. Physical therapists in care communities rarely take this into account. They have a list of people who require therapy. They work down the list. Again, a no when your parent is asked is documented as a refusal with really little thought of the negative consequences that your elderly parent may not eventually be able to walk. The physical therapists don't take that on themselves. They don't worry about it. They just want to get through their jobs. So what's the best way to ensure that elderly parents receive physical therapy after a hip fracture? When possible, if you can be there, it's best. I know it might be difficult to schedule time to get time off work, but a son, a daughter, a wife, Caregiver, you can provide more encouragement and more confidence to your family members so that participation in therapy with no refusals is the result. If at all possible, you should go daily throughout the therapy stay. And if you can't, look at hiring a caregiver who's a CNA through a home care agency. They must be skilled in using a gait belt, transferring and walking. You will have to get approval from the skilled nursing community for a hired caregiver to participate in care. That type of support is good if you can't be there. You've also got to be careful because that person that you hire can't take over the duties of the skilled nursing communities. There's all types of re regulations about that, but I'll tell you, Having a set of second eyes in a care situation is helpful because you may find out a lot of things that happen that you don't even know about because you're not there. Really important, after the rehabilitation stay, daily walking must continue. It's unlikely that care staff in an assisted living, if that's where your parent lives, will have the time to make that type of daily effort. The most you might expect maybe is a walk to dine program where the caregiver will walk with them from their apartment to the dining room. It really is up to you to visit, to hire a caregiver to walk, even if it's only a couple days a week. That activity, again, will support long-term physical ability, quality of life for your elderly parent, and reduce the likelihood of declines. Let's talk about dementia medication connection to physical abilities. More research by Roland confirms that memory medications, they're also called acetylcholine inhibitors, referred to as ACHE, that's medical speak. These medications are often discontinued by physicians. Discontinuing these medications can lead to physical declines that result in falls and injuries. ACHE inhibitors, they pose a positive benefit for walking and other daily functions. Collaborations between geriatricians and specialists has the potential to avoid medications being discontinued. More research, ACHE inhibitors were found to be associated with a lower risk of decline in walking ability. And this factor remains statistically significant in a number of tests. 
they maintain walking ability. As a caregiving advocate and fiduciary in the role of a guardian and power of attorney, I've witnessed the decline in my dementia clients when the physician discontinued. Aricept, galantamine, Nemenda, Exelon without my permission. I've also witnessed behavioral episodes, clients trying to escape from where they lived, running down the street, laying on the floor screaming. Discontinuing any one of these medications is a risky proposition. The declines and the changes after discontinuing these medications are often rapid. Often within a day, I would get calls from frantic caregivers at client homes, assisted living, and memory communities who were concerned about my clients. I appreciated that. The question I always asked was, who made changes in medication? And it was always then that I discovered that a physician had visited, made the changes, didn't ask me. They probably asked my client, and of course, what is your client gonna say? Yes, because they don't know any better. What is your elderly parent going to say? Yes, because they don't know any better. Research proves that these medications have protective actions for walking, for behaviors, for reducing inflammation, and for depression. These biased and sometimes, many times I should say, uneducated physicians cause harm to the daily abilities and functioning of clients. So here's my story of Valentine's Day in the ER, and this was with my client before who had the hip surgery and became immobile and sat mostly in a wheelchair or laid in bed. She eventually was moved to a memory care community, and I and my staff visited her frequently. And we started asking questions about physical therapy and using a Hoyer lift and how much was she getting out of bed in the span of about three days there was a significant change in condition and she exhibited pain. We discovered that she had a significant wound on her bottom from sitting in a wheelchair too long, from not shifting positions, from laying in bed on one side or another. My care staff went and looked at the wound and it was shocking. It was shocking to me that these caregivers had changed her depends, she was incontinent, had changed her depends for a period of two or three days and didn't notice the wound. Didn't notice the wound weeping, didn't notice the odor of the wound. I had to fight with the care staff at this community to have my older client sent to the emergency room. They didn't wanna do it. They wanted to call in care staff or a doctor to come see her. And I said, absolutely not. My care staff has seen the wound. We know what's going on. She has to have treatment. So we sent her out and I was at the hospital that day and it happened to be Valentine's Day. She was in the emergency room and she stayed there for a period of about 12 hours so that we could decide what to do about the wounds. Unfortunately, the wound was so severe by that time. These wounds in your elderly, Clients in your elderly patients with dementia, they exceed the rate of a normal wound. They go so much faster. They get worse so much faster. My client's wound was so bad that we considered <clears throat> surgery, but the other idea, because it had gone so bad, was to put her on a wound care protocol and see if it would begin to improve at all before putting her through surgery. In this case, she was sent to a nursing home. We went on a nutritional protocol. They debrided the wound. They did a lot of care and treatment. Unfortunately, it had gone so far that we had to put her on hospice care and she ended up passing away. This is part of the importance of good nutrition for elderly parents, which again is in one of my webinars, but also the importance of maintaining physical ability. If your parent becomes wheelchair bound, if they become bed bound, make sure that you or somebody is doing skin checks every day. Anything that looks like a bruise, that looks like a red spot, that looks like a black spot, it is a skin wound underneath the skin that will progress very quickly if nothing is done about it. Be very cautious about these types of things. Let's talk about ethical treatment. So ethical treatment was part of my decision for my elderly client with the wound. We had to decide if surgery made sense or if seeing if the wound would improve on its own made sense. Because 
if she had surgery and the wound wasn't going to improve, it would be putting her through a lot of trauma through that surgery. So caring for elderly parents involves a lot of difficult medical decisions. Evidence and practical experience do confirm that caring for elderly parents with dementia, it's complicated and it's challenging. I know because I've been there. When injuries happen, complications can become more apparent and serious for you as the caregiver who has to make the effort to become educated and ask questions about pros and cons, what happens if we do surgery, what happens if we don't do surgery. I realize that it can feel like an impossible job with everything that you've got going on. You're working, caring for elderly parents, taking care of your own families. Caregiving is personal and emotional. It can be exhausting. There are times when looking at the tasks in front of you like a work project can be beneficial because you're focusing on the tasks, attempting to remove the emotions, looking at the pros and the cons, why care should be given, why care should not be given, what are the alternatives. So important, ask for help from other family members. Don't be afraid to tell them that you feel like you're drowning and that you can't keep up. Hold a family meeting, divide up projects, if money exists, hire a care manager to help you go through these situations. I was a professional care manager for 20 years. I helped clients decide on medical decisions and on medical treatment because I had so much experience with other clients in similar situations. Ongoing advocacy is needed to counteract all of the negative perceptions, the biases, the negative beliefs of healthcare providers against care for elderly parents who are diagnosed with dementia. It's highly likely that in any role in caring for an elderly parent with memory loss or not, you will have to make these complicated medical decisions. You will be involved in ethical dilemmas. Decide what your family can contribute in the way of time and money, do what you can. Understand that sometimes you may have to make difficult decisions because you can't do everything that you want. You don't have all the money that you want to provide care for an elderly parent. Sometimes a care community or a nursing home may be the only option. In all of this, learning to advocate with healthcare professionals with confidence is important. Ask questions, your help, your support, your involvement. It's the path to getting the care that you want for your elderly parents. I thank you so much for joining me for this section on medical decisions and ethical care and treatment. If you are the medically responsible party as a power of attorney, as a guardian, do recognize that these decisions can be difficult. You have a high level of responsibility to do what your parent would have wanted, to do what your parent can no longer communicate to you. I know it may be difficult following your parents' wishes if you would want to make a difficult choice because of emotions, but as a legally responsible party, you have the duty to fulfill the care wishes and wants of your older parents and to advocate with the healthcare system who may disagree with you. I'm Pamela D. Wilson, caregiving expert, advocate, and speaker. I'll see you in another webinar.